How's it going, brother? I got the mute mic. Thank you. <laughs> All right, good. Well, it's we're getting there, right? That was a little bit more slick than we normally uh, than we normally manage to pull off for the intro. Yeah for a live stream not too bad at all um let me just make sure that i have unpinned all the right thingies and um i think my video is still pinned there and then, yeah good all right well um so what we're trying to do is just get a little bit more slick every single time and if you are joining us uh hopefully you're starting to get into the rhythm now and uh we'll start being uh able to to just kind of uh, keep this going and uh that way if you know the time slots you can join us it's been great by the way to see some of the guys uh, check in with us along the way. Ari's like had a, a, a bit of a full throttle uh, with two aids sojourner lately. <laughs> um, so that's been great. Um, and in terms of just, uh, you know, making use of, of, of the technology, I mean, I think it's great. It's just sort of roping everything together. We've got, you know, all the best of amateur videoing going on here. Uh, you know, might as well make it live stream. That's what I say. And then, of course, you've got, uh, you know, every benefit from the normal podcasting thing. So hopefully this uh, works out. And if you uh, are listening in and you are sort of, uh, or maybe you're listening to the way this is coming out in terms of the podcast itself, i uh, love to hear your feedback, love to improve it as we go. Um, and so, uh, yeah, stay with us and uh, help us do this thing. Ari is online, dude. Ari, kill him. Hey, Ari. He's made like every session. Um, great job, man. It's, it's kind of like you went to a two age, uh, sojourner conference, didn't you, Ari? It's a, it's quite amazing. I mean, I got Lee Irons this morning, um, and that was fantastic. And, um, and then, uh, who was, I? there was, I think it was Chris on Monday. And then I think I might've got Andre in between. So we've been putting out more content. We'll front load this week and then kind of go, go, go dark for the rest of the week. I got some other stuff I need to do gearing towards the Sunday, but, uh, hopefully that's enough for people if they are listening and, uh, we've got a pretty exciting, um, chapter or what do you call it? Like a, a book essentially to look at. This is usually when we go through our ancient texts and, um, uh, moving our way towards more sort of reformed contemporary text, but basically move, moving our way through the early church stuff. And uh, we've got a, a passage, or at least uh, we're looking at one of the homilies um, out of a, a much greater body of work, but uh, what is known as the 50 spiritual homilies. And um, it's uh, <clears throat> just um, really profound, isn't it, Nick? Did you have a read through it? Yeah, I had a read through it. It was uh, very, very interesting. Yeah, it's it's like John Wesley loved this stuff, <laughs> right? So we've got um we've got this guy yes, who who um you know they call him pseudo Macarius uh, because they used to think he was kind of a desert father guy in Egypt, um, but as as they moved on, they they sort of all settled on the idea that actually this was probably a monk, a Syrian monk, if they have it right, uh, around the three eighties. So. You know, that's pretty, uh, it's still pretty early, but it, it wasn't Macarius. It wasn't uh, the guy uh, that they originally thought. And yet he wrote, he wrote something that had such a big impact uh, on, it seems like, so many different people. Obviously, you've got John Wesley, who refers to this, translated much of, of this work um, in his own uh, lifetime. And, um, and you can kind of see why as you go through. Um, and then uh, who else? I mean, you've got, I think... Um, even some of the guys we've looked at already were were, um, were hit by this. Let me grab my book here. Anything you pulled out uh, about this guy? Yeah, just um, he was originally thought to be by Macarius, the Coptic monk. Um, turns out it wasn't. I heard one theory say that it sounded very similar to something that Gregory Nyssa wrote. Right. So there's there's one theory that says it's it lines up with Gregory Nyssa. Yeah, so that was interesting. Totally. And uh, the guy I was thinking about is uh, we've we've covered we've covered Basil's rules, um, and uh, apparently Basil, um, well, at least uh, they they take the same sort of form as Basil's rules, um, and uh, who knows that he might have even been influenced there. So it just had a they had a big impact, and they're really easy to read. That's what I enjoyed about them. And they just see they seem I don't know if it's the translation that I'm using, but it seems very very fresh, very relevant, and yeah. um, and very in line with the kind of Christianity that is sort of the the common landscape of the day, uh, pietism and so forth. Um, yeah. You know, which is probably the problem with this. I mean, we should say up front that really. 
uh, if anything, it's tended towards, um, in fact, someone took a guess that it had some connection um, to what are those guys called again? Um, kind of that, oh, the uh, Messalanianism um, and the, the sort of proto charismatic movements of the day. You know, it's sort of the, it's real big focus on on spirituality and um, and so forth. So yeah, you know, much of what this, yeah, go apparently for it. this guy's uh, loved by the charismatics because <clears throat> you're looking for miracles post apostolic fathers. This guy talks about exorcisms and miracles and experiences of the Holy Spirit. So mm. yeah, he falls right in line with the Pietistic emphasis, and uh, he is semi Pelagian. Although some of the parts we're going to read actually sounded pretty good to me. But sure. uh, apparently sure. he's a lot more mixed yeah. than, than what we're going to be reading. Right, right. So we've we've got a curated little bit here, and that's an important point to make as well. In that, I think a lot of this, if you um, if you understand it in a in the framework of a good Calvinism or a good Augustinianism or a, a sort of a properly understood, um, not a fatalism, in other words, a well nuanced uh, Calvinism, I think you can incorporate a lot of what he says without feeling too pressured by it. But of course, he does go past the line and um, he's not any, in any way advocating the same kind of Calvinism we are. But there's an overlap and there's a lot of overlap. And uh, again, as we've been doing throughout, I mean, to me, just reading through these little highlights of the 50 homilies, I was just actually struck. Probably I've I feel like this we have most overlap than we've had to this point in all yeah. of our readings. Did you also feel that way? Yeah, it was very familiar territory. <clears throat> yeah, which is interesting. You know, and again, you're looking at 380s. All right, everyone said, are we gonna be long enough to light a cigar? Uh, well, dude, I've got um I've got a decent little bit of whiskey to get through here. Um got a decent book to read. Um I, I definitely think you should light your cigar. That's my vote. Um next got his water bottle. No, I've finished my uh, peppermint tea, bro. So uh, okay, that should be fine. <clears throat> you don't even have your little water heater bottle thing, uh, no, and no, your little no blankie. Water tonight, bro. No blankie. What, no about, blankie? what about a water bottle, bro? <laughs> um, all right. So you know, let's let's also say, like, why do we do this? Um, um, you know, I, I was a bit of a, a well sung song at this point, um, but I just I know I'm mindful that someone might be tuning in for the first time and go, well. You know what, um, pseudo Macarius, fifty homilies. What the heck? I mean, and, and also, um, you know, it's not like Nick or I are claiming to have any level of great expertise on this, any, uh, le any level at all. I mean, uh, both of us are pastors. Both of us love theology. Uh, we uh, love the the early church stuff uh, as much as we can get of it. But um, you know, what I thought to just mention because I think this is this is helpful and this is kind of the heartbeat behind why we're actually doing this. Um, talking this morning to Lee Irons, he made a comment about Greek and first year Greek. And um, and he was basically saying, like I was just saying, like I've been, you know, I feel like I'm never getting past that first year level, no matter how how hard I try, right? And, and he said, well, sometimes you just got to jump in. And uh, I've heard him say that before. You just got to jump in and start reading that Greek and just and just get messy like that. And um, I actually thought about this series that we're doing right here. And that really, that's half the, the issue we don't want to just jump in because it's way too intimidating to read the older texts and uh, we feel like okay we'll just let the pros read that and we rub ourselves in the process uh, you don't have to be an expert to read this stuff and uh to, yeah. to have thoughts about it and certainly you should <coughs> be processing all of the theology you read through the rubric of a pilgrim paradigm you know to make use of of, of what of the stuff we we're promoting here in other words you wanting you're wanting to have a robust systematic theology that is uh, up to date and current and uh, certainly contemporary and able to take the best of the best and weave it all together but then you want to be able to read everything and you want to be able to turn it through that and make sure that that helps you with your discernment of course that applies across the board not only the early church stuff but you have um, an exceptional blessing awaiting you i think if you take that uh, understanding to the early church so that's what we're doing we're just reading it you know we're yeah. just trying to get messy and uh you know it's uh, we're trying to get past first year greek in the equivalent of church fathers <laughs> just jumping <laughs> if, in yeah totally um, all righty. So with that in mind, um, should we just go for it? Nick, what do you reckon? Yeah, let's jump in. All right. You want to take the first paragraph? Yeah, paragraph one. Right. It reads, all intellectual creatures, namely angels, humans, and demons, have been created by the creator, innocent and completely simple. 
that some fell away from these trains and turned to evil was a result of their free will. By their own will, they turned away from right reason. If we assert that such fallen ones were created as such by the creator, we are saying that God is an unjust judge who would cast Satan into fire. Those who affirm that evil exists in itself are really most ignorant. For in God, no evil can exist by itself, since he himself is not subject to passions, and he possesses his divinity. In us, however, it works with full power, especially in our senses, suggesting all sorts of obscene desires. In us, it is not like, say, wine mixed with water. It is more like wheat in the same field by itself and the tares by themselves. It is like a robber in one part of the house and the owner in another. Mm. Yeah. Cool. It's nice to be reading the same, the same actual <laughs> translation. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't find. Much Usually, you've got the high and mighty Philip Schaff version. Yeah, this is. Uh, much yeah, more totally. Um, and that's maybe something worth worth mentioning as well. We've uh, we've got a we're using a specific translation. You might not be able to get it online, but if you can find something, uh, hopefully that's enough to just uh, get you moving along with us. What do you think of that paragraph? I thought it was fantastic. I mean, it goes it goes where we go, and it talks about God and a good creation. He created angels, human beings. He created them all good. And mm-hmm. when they turn towards mm-hmm. sin, they turn towards sin as a, as a result of their own volition, their own will, mm-hmm. that God didn't cause them to be evil. He didn't create evil. It was them that turned towards evil. And so up to that point, we are fully in agreement. Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, almost a bit of an Augustinian thing happening there with the evil. There is no such thing as evil. It's just a parasite of the good sort of thing yeah. um, coming through there. I don't know how intentional that is, but yeah, I mean, in terms of um, you could see at that point, you know, that might sink into a lot of what he's saying that's going a slightly Pelagian direction, but insofar as that stands, um, you know, it, it's completely fine. Uh, in fact, we'd want to affirm that, you know, it, you, he's absolutely correct. If you, if you move past that point, you're in trouble. You're, you're saying things about, God that you shouldn't be and exactly. uh, many many a hyper calvinist have gone past that point uh, yeah. we need to admit that um yeah and then in terms of just um i think one of the things that uh is striking about that to me as well is the way that it you know it speaks about the sin that's so powerful and active in the christian uh who who you know of course it's 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 uh, we're thinking in different terms to that which we think about God, but really, I mean, as you move through this uh, homily, you start seeing, okay, well, He really is taking inherent sin and uh, and you know total depravity and its work uh, very seriously, and um, and you know it's kind of interesting because you've got John Wesley associated with all the perfectionism, second blessing stuff, but there are a few things he says in this that you know, it almost counteracts anything that John Wesley would say uh, or, or anything that he would later be attached to in terms of the ho- holiness movement. <coughs> so um, we'll leave that. I think he comes back to that a little bit later, but uh, let me read the second uh, yeah. or the third, third chapter. Yeah. Uh, let me just try and knock my computer. Yeah, just to over. say this is homily 16 or 50. Yes. Good. Thank that you. That was paragraph one. This is paragraph three. Good. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, let's, Have a look. Um, Homily 16, paragraph 3, or chapter 3. There are some who, even though they have begun to develop a taste for divine things, nevertheless are disturbed and hassled by the adversary, so that they are surprised, still lacking experience, that after the divine visitation, they should still harbor doubts about the mysteries of the Christian religion. Those who have grown old in them are not surprised at all. As skilled farmers from long experience, if they've had a year of bountiful harvest, they do not live without some planning, but they foresee the time of dearth and tight times. Um, On the contrary, if famine and penury hit them, they do not become despondent as they think positively about the future. It is the same way with things in the spiritual world. When the soul falls into various temptations, it is not surprised, nor does it lose all hope, because it knows that by God's permission, it is being exposed to trials and is being disciplined by evil. Nor does it forget other circumstances when things go well and there is consolation, but it expects the time of trial. That's a great yeah. paragraph, isn't it? Yeah, very good. I mean, it's, oh, man. Uh, it's great comfort for the, the young Christian. You know, the young Christian has that wonderful experience and he, 
he talks about uh, after the divine visitation. I imagine that he's talking about some early experience of the Christian life. Right, right. And then um, all of a sudden, trials start to come, and they're really rattled by those trials. Yeah. And he talks about how the mature person recognizes that, you know, to prepare for trials. And uh, I just uh, I thought it was uh, it was quite brave of him to say that um, by God's permission, it is it is it is being exposed to trials and is being disciplined by evil. Yeah. That's that's quite a big statement in terms. It's a big of statement, but it gets me thinking about Job. Exactly. You know, and um, it, it almost reminds me of the way the Puritans spoke, where you know they'll they'll sort of be sick and dying, and they'll speak about God visiting them with a fever. You know, <laughs> <laughs> which is just let's be honest, not the way that we uh, automatically process things today uh, with our our sort of happy go lucky version of Christianity. So I think this is really desperately needed. What I found interesting, though, if you know the the John Wesley um, holiness. Uh, or at least the perfectionism kind of thing that moved on to the holiness movement. Um, you know, you had the kind of second blessing pre Pentecostal sort of thing going on in that, right. you know, you're expecting these warm feelings. And then from that point on, and, you know, I think there is some misunderstanding. I don't think John Wesley ever did say that, you know, we are without any trace of sin, but it's just, there's this crazy victory that's won at that point. And um, you sort of are on the up and up from that point on. Um, and it seems like, you know, if he, if, if there is any kind of, synchronizing there with the, the the visitation that's spoken of here and the the doubts that come afterwards um it seems to be in defiance of any perfectionism uh that's problematic um you know and so i don't have any problem with with saying that yeah i mean you could have experiences you can have high and lofty moments in the christian life you can have moments that you're just really on the top <laughs> of the mountain but uh you know don't expect that that means you're suddenly without sin and yeah. um, and I think it is true that a mark of someone who's been in the Christian life for a while is that they perhaps do panic a little bit less about these things, um, and you know they they know where to run and they know they know how to come to their savior. They are more trustful that he would forgive them perhaps than they were. Uh, you know, in those things, um, not to say in any uh, in any way that that sin becomes less um, uh, less. Um, torturous to the soul or, or less problematic to the believer, but there is a, you know, this is sanctification, right? We, we grow yeah. in an understanding of Christ's love for the fact, despite the fact that we're just these worms. And, uh, and as we increase in confidence uh, that he would receive us, I mean, that's, that helps us in the, in the long haul as we grow in, in, in our discipleship. So I like that paragraph for, for the way that it, it highlights that idea. Um, Amen. And the farmer analogy is great as well. Like farmers don't freak out, you know, just because there's one little moment. They're, they're ready for the battle. They're, they're in it for the long haul. Um, yeah. And there's something almost Jerry Bridges like about this, which I like. Yeah, and it's it's not triumphalistic. The whole no. idea of, uh, you know, uh, weeds, among, <clears throat> weeds among the wheat earlier as well. You know, that's it's, it's, it's not only wheat. It's not all heaven on earth. There's uh, a... Yeah. The recognition of uh, a mixed experience. It's not all pure triumphalism. Yeah, for sure. Um, good. So that, that's uh, second, our second paragraph, the third chapter. Yeah. It's going well so all far, right? right? So it's paragraph amazing. Four. All right. Paragraph yep. four. Here we go. When, therefore, a man is deep and rich in grace, there still remains inside of him a remnant of evil. But he has close at hand one who can help him. Wherefore, if one is overwhelmed by temptations, caught in the raging waves of passions, he ought not to lose hope. For if he acts in this way, sin builds up and takes over from within. If, however, one constantly puts his hope in God, evil to a certain degree diminishes and dries up. Certain people are afflicted with paralysis, some with mutilated members, others with fever, while others have sickness. All of this comes from sin. For sin is the root of all evils. <clears throat> the passions caused by the concupiscible powers of the soul <laughs> and by evil thoughts also flow from sin. Yeah, great, great, um, great paragraph again. You know, um, I think much more of, of what we were saying earlier there, I think as well, just uh, you've got 
you've got this um, sort of carrying on with the theme of, okay, this could very well be the case that you're overwhelmed at certain points. Um, well, what do you make of, of his uh, statement there that shouldn't lose hope because there'll be some degree at which you you'll conquer this thing or, or it loses power. I, th I thought that was helpful. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it's on the one hand, he's admitting that we're not going to have heaven on earth, mm. but he's also admitting that uh, God's grace is sufficient. God, you know, there is joy to be had. There is peace to be had. There is peace that transcends our understanding, which mm. we got our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> you know, there, we were, we were able to rejoice in hope, a hope that is, uh, uh, joy and expressible and full of glory. Mm. Yeah, and there are these sorts of assurance moments in the Christian life that, where the spirit of adoption bears witness with our spirit, that we're children of God as we gaze at the cross, as we, as the spirit ministers the wonder of the gospel and our adoption to us. Those are moments of great comfort that can turn our hearts away from sin. And so yeah. we're more ravished with Christ than we are with sin. And um, I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't, meet that out as much as we're saying right now but but those mm. are the sorts of comforts that we can have and the sorts of things that can draw our hearts away from sin that's what we would preach mm -hmm. um so yeah i think it's it's wise it's a wise recognition that you, you do have resources to fight with but don't expect total triumphalistic victory right and yet don't expect absolute defeat with no moments of triumph you know as you were saying earlier just a, a helpful i mean i think about especially as uh, you know, I've got Wesley on the mind here and I remember coming from a Wesley and then it was the same for you, you know, just moving from that kind of yeah. hardcore Finianism to, uh, to a uh, Calvinistic worldview. And I think probably what I did in hindsight is that, you know, I went all the way from the, you know, beyond Wesley, let's leave Wesley out of it actually, because really Finney's the guy on this one. Um, you know, listen, the only reason you're sinning is because you're sinning and you, you can just stop anytime you want. Right. So get your life together because, you know, at the end of the day, that's what this comes down to. God expects you to stop sinning. And uh, if you're sinning, it's just ridiculous. So, you know, time to, time to grow up, time to pull yourself together. And so I was, um, yeah, I mean, that was very much my jam. And then, you know, add some street preaching to that and uh, bada bing, bada boom, you've got yourself a zealot, you know? Exactly. Um, but um, I remember just, you know, coming to the end of myself by God's grace and uh, moving toward, toward a, a Calvinistic understanding. I think I did. I think it's, it's true looking back that I, I went too far into the Puritanism to the Puritan defeatism, um, almost uh, David Brainerd kind of, uh, you know, pessimism. There is just yeah. no hope. And it's almost like you're, you're giving um, sin too much glory. You're not factoring in the cross and the reality of the eschatological, you know, intrusion, this breakthrough that has come upon you, uh, yeah. you the reality of the new covenant. You, uh, you know, there is, I, I remember even just hearing reformed guys and probably a lot of what snapped me out of it, I think, is um, hearing them speak as though the heart was not even renewed, that you yeah. didn't even have, you, you're not even regenerate, you know, you're just exactly who you were, um, it, you know. And, and I know that people at their best are trying to emphasize the reality of remaining sin, and I'm all about that as well. But yeah. I think when we can do that in such a way that, um, you know, we talk about you know, what's on my heart, only sin, you know, it's, that's just not true. Um, yeah. You know, if like, that so was true. Are you a saint who sins? Have you heard it put that way? Are you Say a it again, sir. Saved? Are you a sinner who's saved or are you a saint who sins? Right, right. Totally. You know, it's, what's your perspective? Because if it's, yeah. you know, because we can be so navel gazing, we stop looking at the cross, we stop, stop looking at the work of the spirit, we stop looking at our life hidden with Christ in God. And all we're doing is we're looking at ourselves. And, and like the man in Romans 7, if you look at yourself through the lens of the law, mm. all you're going to see is the sin. Mm. But if you don't look at yourself through the lens of justification and adoption and all of the other important lenses that we should be looking at ourselves with, mm. then yeah, Romans 7 will be our constant experience. Right, totally. I mean, I think even just we talk freely, I think everyone would agree that when you come to Christ, there is a breach of the power of sin. You know, that, that's just one of those things. It's, it's not a total uh, ultimate sanctification, but it's a definitive sort of uh, move forward. And uh, you're not who you were. And there is something that's different. It, it, sin just does not have the hold over you that it did. Uh, and, and at that level, I think it's right to be, to be telling ourselves and almost to get a little bit of hit over the head sometimes. Um, listen, you know, don't behave like a cowering, fearful slave. 
you know, yeah. because that's not you anymore. And, you know, when you, when you're talking about sin as though Christ hasn't even come, you know, that's, that's something that is going to negatively affect your, your Christian life. It's really, you're not giving glory to Jesus as you should be. Uh, not to mention the way that, you know, that's going to lead you into some sort of self-fulfilled prophecy or whatever it is. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that you have to, you don't often find this well balanced, and uh, when it is well balanced, it's very, very powerful. I think, you know, because uh, as he does, and I think this is great the way that that he's put it, because there is, there's a it's sort of a, a combination of, of this great hope that you have, um, you know, and you know what I'm actually thinking about is the first uh, epistle of John, where he's basically saying, listen, if you say you're without sin, you know, you're lying, you you're don't lying. have the truth yeah. in you, so just get off that trip, but, but. You know, here's the bottom line. You're going to sin. And when you do sin, um, you have an advocate, you know, so don't lose hope. Uh, yes. Jesus Christ, the righteous, cleanses you of all unrighteousness. It's just uh, perfectly balanced in that way. And um, and re- that's what we need to be striving for. To lose one or the other, I think, is going to, is going to um, you know, mess around with us. Um, I am yep. seeing someone, uh, ACA Swell, A Caswell. That's not ACA swell. It's it's a Caswell. Uh, what, dude, give us your name. Um, I don't know. A, a Caswell eighty four. But hey, thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, anyway, so our, we are um, wanting to just uh, make. I mean, you can see why they like this, right? You could see why they yeah. got onto this. This would have been helpful in just providing that balance or advocating from an early church perspective that balance that they were they were promoting. Andrew, that's it. Andrew Caswell. Good to see you. Or not see you, you know what I mean? Uh, thanks for joining us, man. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to take us on to, uh, do you have any more comments on that paragraph before I move on? Uh, just a quick look. Um, no, I thought, I think we covered it. I, I, did, I, was, I was unsure of what he meant by the last two lines. All of this comes from sin. For, um, and he's talking there about paralysis, mutilated members, fever. Is he is he is he falling into the trap of saying that uh, you know we we get sick because we sin, or is he relating it to the fall, or is he relating it to our individual sins? So I was just unclear as to what he meant there. So there's just a question mark in my mind. I'm not accusing him of saying too much, but I just have a question. I'd I'd like to know more of what he means by that. Yeah, well, actually, um, I kind of like that in that it seemed again quite balanced to me in that he was connecting sin. Uh, at least all suffering and all curse to sin. Um, And yet keeping that from being a a kind of um, uh, making it too much of a thing, Uh, you know, not an individual personal punishment thing is what I was uh, immediately thinking about that, but I might've read into it. Um, But yeah, Yeah, probably, uh, probably there is something going on there. It would be interesting to read the rest of these. I am my, my curiosity is peaked definitely to read the rest (laughs) of these now, because this seems like good reading and easy reading. And by the way, if anyone is, is uh is listening to this and you do uh, come across a good copy on the internet of uh of these homilies uh let us know we'll put it on the show notes and uh we weren't able to track anything decent down um but this would be great great to have access to all right good um so i'm on paragraph 12 10 10 10 all right second last one (coughs) Uh, here we go there are those who claim that there is no sin in man They are like people immersed in deep waters who still are afraid to recognize the fact, but say, we have heard the sound of waters. (laughs) So plunged into the depths uh, of the waves of evil, they deny that there is sin in their minds or thoughts. Some people talk a great deal, but they are not seasoned with a heavenly salt. They speak a great deal about the royal table, but they have never eaten there or enjoyed it. But different is the one who has seen the king, one to whom the treasures have been opened. He enters in and inherits them. He eats and drinks of these costly foods. Awesome. It's yeah, good. I like this seems guy. He seems like he's comparing two, two types of people. Yeah. Those who say these things are real but have no experience of them. Uh, and so you have the perfectionist on the one hand and then even the true believer. Yeah. You know, They've heard of the royal table, but they've never tasted of its fruits. I've heard of sin, but I'm not a sinner. And he's just putting those two people out there as the same sort of person. Yeah. Kind of a reference almost to uh, what what happens later with Pilgrim's Progress. You got talkative, just likes to talk it up. Um, Hasn't felt the 
that uh, that effect of sit on his own heart. And that's kind of one of the one of the uh, paragraphs that I, you know I was surprised that Wesley would even go with this if he had any inklings of perfectionism because there he's he's clearly saying, listen, you know you really don't want to be going down that track at all. You don't want yeah. to be claiming that you I mean, have. Wes, Wesley's doctrine of sanctification was, you know, he believed in total depravity. Yeah. But he believed in the necessity of prevenient grace, which was universal, <clears throat> which enabled anyone to believe so that uh, when Jesus died on the cross, every single person was loosed from the power of sin. Mm. And when you get saved, you still have a sinful nature, but you, you are able to grow in such love towards God that you have absolutely no love or inclination towards sin. And at that moment of peak love towards God, you've mm. reached entire sanctification. Yeah. So that, yeah. that was his view. And yeah. So that, this, 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 this doesn't necessarily, because this paragraph is denying Pelagianism. Right. right. But it's not yeah. denying and, semi-Pelagianism or a semi-semi-Pelagianism in the case of Wesley. Yeah. And that's a good point to make. Or in more terms of, of a, just, Arminianism. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to distinguish between the two. I do believe that. You know, I mean, uh, Wesley just was not Pelagian in that sense in any way. No. Uh, he was hardcore. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So he would be typically Arminian, and Arminius agreed with total depravity. Yeah. 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 Sort of a historical Arminianism. Good. Yeah. The uh, the other form of holiness teaching I got into was uh, some of the Keswick stuff. So just as you are justified by faith alone, you're sanctified by faith alone. So just as you come in one trusting moment to receive the gift of, of an imputed, imputed righteousness, so you come for one, at one moment and you receive entire sanctification. Mm, mm. You just accept it by faith. Exactly. Another, yeah, right. Another right. brand of holiness rubbish that I adopted for a while. Yeah, totally. Well, Andrew just asked, uh, is it a second work of grace in Wesley? What was uh, he, Did he advocate that second work of grace idea. So Wesley did have a two-story worldview where he uh, had a first experience, which, which, which was the experience of salvation and justification mm. by faith alone. And um, he did have a, a two-story worldview where he created a, a second category. So John Wesley is the father of the two-story framework, which the charismatic church is built on or the Pentecostal church is built on. So the Pentecostal church believes in a second blessing. Mm. And uh, they've borrowed the framework that John Wesley set up. So he is the father of the, the two-story worldview when it comes to a second blessing. Yeah. So yeah. He, he did believe in a second experience of grace. So it wasn't as developed as later theology, no. made Pentecostalism, and then charismatic and third wave and so on. But yeah, he set up the structure. Yeah. He spoke. So he uh, spoke. A, great, a great analysis of John Wesley's thinking, and I'm just quoting here J.R. Packer. Mm-hmm. Um, he's done some uh, keeping in step with the spirit. He yeah. does an analysis of, yeah. of Wesley's spirituality. It's very, very, very good. He's very sympathetic. He talks about their deep passion. He talks about their great uh-huh. hymn. He talks about, you know, just the joy and the the vibrant spirituality that they advocate. But he's also very accurate in in just tearing apart some of the errors of their theology. Yeah, great book. I love the way. Um, one of my favorite parts of that book, keeping in step with the spirit. Is where he's like, well, you know, let's talk about tongues. Let's think about tongues for a little bit. Um, da da da. You know, it's linguistically baseless. It doesn't really have any, <laughs> any, uh, any merit in terms of any biblical argument. But is that does that mean there's no point to it? Well, no, because it's kind of like the rosary. <laughs> you know, the rosary is, you know, you can use it like a rosary. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was great. Like, like only only an Anglican's going to talk like that, right? Find yeah. find some value in the Rosary, number one, and then number two, uh, you know, to to kind of ascribe the modern day tongues movement to that as a helpful thing, man. Classic. So you got to read that book if you haven't read Keeping in Step with the Spirit. I tell people to read it all the time. It's a great book, very very uh-huh. insightful. That book got me out of the charismatic movement. Oh, there you go. Very good. Yeah, um, more than any other book, I would say. So. You know, even though even though he wasn't trying to do it, you know, he was he was being very, as you say, very, uh, you know, understanding with everyone. But it's just very like iron. I was like, nah, I don't want it. I don't want yeah. it after you <laughs> exactly. just completely yeah. slammed it. Yeah, Peck is a much nicer man than I am. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Good. Okay, uh, where are we? Good last... question. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Last paragraph. Paragraph twelve. So now he, uh, he's talking about the man who recognizes himself as a sinner as opposed to the one who talks about himself as having no sin. It reads, Such a one regards himself as the greatest of all sinners. He carries this thought ever with him as a part of his very makeup. 
And the more he progresses in knowledge of God, the more simple and unlearned he considers himself. And the more he studies and learns, the less he feels he knows. This grace acts as a guiding force, almost second nature to him, just as an infant is carried about by a young man who carries him and does with him whatever he wishes. So also the grace that operates in the depths of the soul's powers. It feeds the mind and lifts it up to heaven, to the perfect world, to everlasting rest. But in such a grace, there are many degrees and perfections. Mm. So there's some great statements there about the fact that, you know, the more you know of yourself, you know, uh, I think it's, uh, there's the, what was Paul's progression? The least amongst the apostles, the least yep. amongst the saints, the chief of yep. sinners. So as Paul gets older, you see that progression in, in thinking. So there's a very clear uh, recognition of uh, that necessary attitude of humility. Mm -hmm. um, but then at the, at the end, he does talk about different degrees and perfections. And I, I wasn't sure <laughs> he's going there. You just get nervous, <laughs> right? You can't help it. It's in that time period. You're like, dude, just leave the degrees of perfection thing alone. But yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, insofar as he means glory to glory, <laughs> means you know an advance in in sanctification um uh insofar as you might mean uh there are just different spaces in which you find different people along the pilgrimage as it were um you know amen um but if there's more than that if there's some sort of he was quite influential on the eastern um fathers as well um yeah. which was interesting so I, you know there could well be a link there and uh, we're, we'd be out of our, our lane there to, to try and comment on it. But, but at the end of the day, um, you know, as it stands, it's a good curation of, of, of his homily. Yeah. Um, even if, even if, on, even if we just extract those paragraphs from his 50 homilies, they're pretty darn good. Yeah. Very good stuff. <clears throat> I mean, that's, that's comfortable ground for us. Yeah. And, uh, we, you know, the, the big thing about church history is we read it with humility. We read it recognizing that these are the men that came before us that we've built on their shoulders, yeah. that we have to give credit to the way that the Lord has used them. And that the only reason we know better is because they made the mistakes first. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's still much to get though. And I'm very thankful for, for this sort of thing. Yeah. 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 Amen. Well, there we go. There we go. That's some, um, what, what do we call them? That's some pilgrim theology from the ancient ones. <laughs> Pseudo Macarius. Pseudo Macarius. 50 spiritual homilies. Um, I wonder what he would have done about <clears throat> lockdown and, um, and church on Sunday. <clears throat> yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> did you hear that the lockdown has been extended by a week? No, I didn't. Is that right? Yeah. Five weeks. Wow. There you go. Well, <clears throat> I mean, so, so far, not a lot, to be totally honest, not a lot has changed for me uh, outside the Sunday gathering. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I'm just kind of in my office like I normally am. It's kind of cool having the kids home. But um, yeah, look, it'd be interesting to see where it all goes. Uh, what we need to do, what we keep on meaning to do and what we will do at some point during the lockdown, I, I hope, is talk about the whole church thing and live streaming and because we have a we're doing different things, which I think yeah. would make a good, interesting discussion there. And um, let's not forget to do that because yeah, otherwise so we're going to miss the whole lockdown thing and then it's not even going to be relevant. By the way, folk in our church tuned into your live stream on Sunday. I did see a few, a few uh, uh, you know, sort of messages yeah. from your church. I'm like, uh, what's going on here? Yeah. And so in the evening, because we didn't run an evening service, they listened to my sermon. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. As long as you also like, listen. Man, you should check out what GraceNet's doing. We should just do just like GraceNet. <laughs> and I'm like, no, GraceNet's wrong. Yeah, oh, so. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if you're interested, come back for that one. That's uh, that's that's the next subject of conversation. Um, well, thanks to the guys that tuned in on live stream. Great to hang out with you guys um, and to have that discussion with you keep reading guys keep reading the church fathers and uh get just jump in get uncomfortable with them and uh let's let's keep talking it through um i would say go to church but you know that's kind of yeah. a little bit it's not really gonna work <laughs> go to church yeah okay we'll we'll leave you, <clears throat> I, you definitely need to worship on sunday yeah are we in agreement there amen amen so set something apart and we'll talk about what celebrate exactly the lord's day remember amen. the lord's day Amen. Amen. Or you could just tune into GraceNet if, if, <laughs> if it's too complicated for you. <laughs> All right. So with that in mind, uh, we're going to go. Um, uh, I'm going to try and do a really uh, a slick 
fade out. How's that sound to you? Sounds good. I'll mute. All righty. All right, it's not so slick at the moment. I'll uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll admit. Here we go. It just started getting slick. <laughs>